Hello, my name is Monice Newman, and I serve as the national consultant for the International March of the Living. I want to take this opportunity to say good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone who has joined us from all corners of the globe to learn from and with our esteemed survivor, Gabriela Kalu, a talented artist, sculptor, and Holocaust educator who has traveled on March of the Living with the BJE Los Angeles team delegation eight times. She has recently published her memoir, Trauma, Memory, and the Art of Survival, which tells her incredible story of survival. I have had the pleasure of marching with Gabriella numerous times, and she serves as our collective guide and inspiration. Gabriella will be interviewed today by my fellow marcher and colleague, Randall Freed. Randall is currently a Jewish communal consultant with a focus on community engagement and development. Randy is also a member of the Jewish Diplomatic Corps of the World Jewish Congress. His recent activities include a diplomatic mission to the United Arab Emirates, ongoing work with the UAE consulate and embassy to increase connections between the US Jewish community and the UAE, and lobbying members of the California state legislature to withdraw a proposed education bill that exhibited anti-Israel bias. Since 2008, Rankle has been working with the Los Angeles team delegation of BJE Los Angeles March of the Living as a staff member as a Holocaust educator as well. Since graduating from UCLA with a degree in political science, he has developed a passion for connecting college-bound Jewish teens to their history teaching the story of the European jury beyond the Shoah and coming to understand the Holocaust as the story of one person at a time. He is married with two small children and is an active member of the Los Angeles Jewish community and an elected official in his local community. Since its inception in 1988, the International March of the Living has brought over 275,000 students and adults, both Jewish and non-Jewish, from over 40 countries around the globe to Poland on Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Remembrance Day, and Israel for Yom HaZikaron and Yom HaAtzma'ot, Israel's Memorial Day and Israel's Independence Day. The work of the International March of the Living has had tremendous impact on its participants and has served as a call to action for our thousands of alumni to do their part to fight for a future free of anti-Semitism, racism, hatred, and intolerance. While we continue to navigate this new world we all find ourselves in, the International March of the Living remains determined to continue to educate the world about the horrors of the past in order to ensure a better future. It is now my esteemed pleasure to turn over the webinar to Randall Freed and Gabriella Curry. Moniz, thank you so much uh, for the beautiful introduction. Gabriella, it is so nice to see you, albeit virtually, uh, the pandemic as, as these things go. I think the last time I saw you actually was in Poland in January of 2020 uh, for the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz uh, for a very powerful program, uh, and in many ways, all the more so um, as we find ourselves uh, separated from each other um, and so many others separated. I, there's so many questions I could ask you about your childhood in Bratislava, being across the street from the Slovak Nazi Gestapo, hiding uh, the Righteous Among the Nations, Carol Blanner. There's so many, what your life has been like since, which is uh, nothing short of amazing. But I wanted to first start uh, where, if you remember when we were in Poland, Marian Tursky, the survivor, spoke, and he talked about uh, a lot of his questions being around the subject of students and the next generation. And so I thought that would be an appropriate place for us to start. 
you've been sharing your story for many years and have spoken to many students. Um, with that said, I'm curious what you have learned about yourself through this process. And what, if anything, has surprised you about the questions that you've been asked over the years? As I kept telling my story to the many impressionably young students, I was appalled to see a great level of ignorance about the history of the Holocaust. The most basic facts were a revelation. I was gratified to have made a deep impact on them. In the process, I've experienced an inner strength and compulsion to go on teaching the lessons of the Holocaust and the dangers of apathy. I'm curious, have you always shared your story? Did you begin to share your story later in life? And if it was later in life, what, what prompted it? I began sharing my story later in life as I realize that the Holocaust memory is becoming trivialized, denied, and outright denigrated by so-called historians like David Irving. It evoked in me an anger which prompted me into action to make visual art instead of written words will explain the tragedy of the Holocaust in a different way and this is what I am achieving. You certainly are. And, and I wonder, with so much work that you've done, at the same time, we see, unfortunately, a rise in anti-Semitism around the world. Uh, and painful to say, as Americans, we are seeing a rise here at home and even in Los Angeles. Um, what do you attribute this to, and what is your advice? I feel that the global rise in anti-Semitism is a testimony to the ever underlining new Jew hatred that's been always seizing below the surface, and it's instilled first by the Christian church over the centuries, and in our time, by the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as an excuse. Its poison is now being spread by the extreme left and the extreme right to gain political power. My advice how to fight it is by incessant education of the masses and the extensive use of the legal tools available in the United States, the US courts. The Jews are no longer powerless and we must use our power to fight back our enemies. Yes, yes and. I, I'm wondering, so with all of that, to zoom out, we then can, we can look at the past nearly Hard to believe. Nast the nearly the past two years, we had the world has been gripped by a pandemic. Uh, we find ourselves right in the beginning. We were locked down. We were sanitizing everything. Afraid to go outside. Afraid to see each other. Uh, and in some ways, the world is going back to that place of countries in Europe locking down uh, their societies. I I I'm curious. Uh, and we've seen people compare, make comparisons uh, to those in the show that were in hiding. But I, I'm curious for you, how, how have you coped with the last two years of being having to really separate yourself from, from so many? And, and how have you coped? The pandemic outbreak has at first frightened me as everyone else, yet I have applied the skills of resistance and turned what seemed a despairing situation into an opportunity. I began creating more art, began to more vigorously making myself available as a webinar speaker through the Holocaust Museum LA and the Museum of Tolerance, where I have reached a huge audience worldwide. It was a learning experience 
showing me that in every cloud there is a silver lining. One has to recognize it. Uh, it's uh, it's a great uh, it's a great lesson and and worth worth repeating. You mentioned in your answer about art being being a form of expression, uh, and and I'm curious when did art become a way of expression for you? Did it start as a child? Later in life? After retirement, I decided not to become an idle housewife. Instead, I enrolled in an art school and I became fascinated with sculpturing in clay. I already had working with clay and I have an art art artistic background as a clothes designer and pattern maker. So mastering the art of working with clay wasn't too hard for me. It, and it became a passion of mine. So I have certainly enjoyed marching with you and so have so many teens. I'm curious about what draws you to the March of the Living program and what have you gained? When I first became aware of this March of the Living program, it fascinated me, the idea of worldwide gathering of Jewish people in solidarity, marching to and through Holocaust history, honoring those innocent millions that so brutally were murdered by the Nazis, just fired me up. It was a cause holy to me, and I wanted to be inseparable part of this movement, but I have gained from this experience was a deep, gratifying, emotional bond that was soothing and healing. You certainly have made a large impact on, on the thousands of teens that, that you have marched with, have spoken before. And as Monice mentioned, a number I didn't know, 275,000 Teenagers, young adults, adults have traveled on the March of the Living, a commemorating memory. Uh, and yet, we, as we mentioned earlier, there is a significant rise of anti Semitism around the world. And so it begs the difficult question of do you feel the world has learned the lessons of the Holocaust? No, I don't believe that the world wants to dwell on the lessons of this historical tragedy. Humankind seems to preoccupied with their everyday worries about hunger, disease, and poverty of the world's majorities. The West would rather sweep the Holocaust under the rug or the dustbin of history and not be always reminded of their collective responsibility. And with that, we also see Holocaust denial. And so I wonder with this, in terms of Holocaust legacy, do you think that there is a chance that in 50 to 100 years, the Holocaust will be in the dustbin of history? The Jewish people have so far been able to officially deflate this vicious denial, especially through the courts of justice. Yet, the prospect of preserving the memory and lessons of the Holocaust for the distant future depends entirely on Jewish people's efforts to untiringly remind the world about it. The annual commemoration of Yom HaShoah is an essential act of reminding the world that this tragedy must never be forgotten. Thank God for Israel to keep the flame of memory burning bright after the eyewitnesses of the Holocaust are no longer with us. The coming generation must take up the flame of memory and hold it high. It is their sacred duty. When we think about an annual gathering and we think about the March of the Living and or the uh, milestone anniversary gatherings that happened that you and I saw each other in Auschwitz in 2020. Uh, 
I wonder about, you know, Marion Tursky talked about, he chose not to speak about his suffering and rather he wanted to speak about, speak, he was more interested in connecting with his grandchildren and their friends. And this idea that he, in a, of a conversation about Auschwitz didn't just fall from the sky. And he talked about apathy, which you have mentioned. I'm curious what your message is, not to people like me, but perhaps to my children are a little young, but to the teens, to a younger generation that is up and coming in school, that is, uh, or college students that are seemingly co so concerned with, with uh, seemingly everyone's rights, perhaps, uh, but sometimes, but for the Jews. I'm curious, what is your message to a younger generation? Do not ever be complacent. Do not ever be apathetic or indifferent to emerging evil. Always be keenly aware that any status quo can quickly change in a political firestorm. Stand firm and resolve against the enemies of freedom and equality. Educate yourself in your own Jewish heritage and rich history. These are the best weapons to counteract with your enemies. I think that's well said. And I, I, I think that it's also important because as, as you know, because we, we also have marched with and so many, uh, I would, on the one hand, we could say still not enough. So many non-Jews have, have also joined in speaking up and speaking out that we also spend the time to engage with those who want to learn that are outside of our, our own Jewish history. And as we mentioned earlier, your artwork and a form of expression uh, in many ways does is, is a, another way as if your speaking and engagement in a very in very painful memories wasn't enough. Your artwork uh, speaks uh, to many people likely in many ways. And one of the pieces of artwork I, I wanted to ask you about is the Tower of Agonizing, uh, six million Jewish plus five million. Um, and I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about what was the inspiration for that artwork? What does it mean to you? What does it represent? I felt that this sculpture can show the world that not only Jewish people were persecuted. This was the main goal, but alongside, besides the six million Jewish people that were murdered, there were also five million non-Jewish people, like the homosexuals, people like um, the gypsies, handicapped, handicapped people. Can you believe it? Killed. And Christians who politically were against the regime, Hitler regime, Christians who participated and politically were working against it, partisans. And I noticed in the sculpture, so the sculpture looks like it's it's four four pillars. It's six. six oh, it's six. six. Okay, yes. I Now I see that they're slightly offset and in the picture. The, it's hard to see on the sculpture because it's round. And how big is the sculpture? Oh, it's about 36 inch tall. And how, is this something that sits in your home? Is this in a museum for people to see? I know right now it sits in my home. Yes. It sits on a pedestal. Very nice. And the other piece of art that I I personally have always found moving, so I, I will, uh, I, I'm happy to ask you about it uh, as I have in the past, is Shimmering Leaves. Um, and, and before talking about it, I think that it's, 
uh, something that's amazing that you have done for several marches, every march, is uh, you have handcrafted a leaf. Uh, and just like, uh, just like each one of us, no, no two le- uh, people, no two leaps are alike. And uh, I have mine, and actually over the years, I think I have a couple extra that will uh, be gifts to my children uh, when the time comes to have the difficult conversation about this painful history. Um, can you share with people shimmering this, this incredible piece of art, shimmering leaves, how big is it? What was the idea behind it? Where can we see that? I'd love to, for you to share. Well, I felt that the leaf that is falling down from a tree is not alive anymore. So this is a symbol for Jewish people who were so mercilessly murdered. This sculpture is nine feet tall that you see here, shimmering leaves, perished families. The leaves, are falling from the tree. They are connected with fish wire. So they are moving and the whole thing is rotating. I actually saw this sculpture to the University Laverne and they built an interface building. And um, in the lobby, my sculpture is rotating. Wow, so if anyone is visiting California, they'll go to Laverne, University of Laverne and and see this sculpture. Um, What's amazing about this sculpture, yes, a falling leaf uh, is no longer alive. uh, And yet the the beauty and duality of a tree is that if elements of this tree, tree still live, new leaves can be born anew. And your work with the March of the Living, with the LA, uh, Holocaust Museum LA, Museum of Tolerance, um, and I would say most notably the March of the Living with so many thousands of teens, uh, all of these young Jewish teens especially are budding new leaves on, a, on our tree. Uh, that you uh, so carefully and and lovingly uh, kind of shepherd through an understanding of a dark history and ultimately a better understanding, I think, of ourselves and and where we find ourselves today. Uh, A question I didn't say, I didn't tell you in advance that I was going to ask you, but a question I wanted to ask you uh, after this conversation is, what advice do you have for parents? We see today, you, you mentioned passionately the importance of Israel. Um, we see that, that you know, nowadays there are always comparisons to people like to compare anything that goes wrong. People want to say it's like the Holocaust, right? So if it was, um, and I wonder, and we see teens being pushed and pulled in so many different directions, whether it's for political reasons or if it's for social justice reasons or, uh, and sometimes we see this push and pull, uh, pull Jewish teens away from their, away from Israel or away from uh, their Jewishness. Um, and I'm curious as a, uh, as someone who sits seeing a fair amount of life um, and experiences you've had, what's, what would your advice be to parents? If possible, send your children to Israel. This is what I did with my son. First year when we went, we was one month in a kibbutz, kibbutz Palmachin, south of Tel Aviv. He loved it, and one month in Natanya, our family. He liked it so much, and we said, well, we, I want to go back. I want to go back, OK? We don't have enough money, da, da, da. He said, OK, I will help. He was 14. He got a job as an 
assistant tennis uh, teacher. And he put every dollar away and he got the fare to go. Well, how can you fight with this, right? Wow. <laughs> so he was going every year after that until finish high school, until college. And he loved it. And it made a good job out of him. You know, it's <laughs> it's um, impossible not to breathe the air there and not to love it. I, you know, you're, I have to say, it's, it's so, you know, when you speak about, which is what I would expect, and of course, you know, when you speak about family, when you speak about Israel, you really do light up. Um, and uh, it's, it's wonderful. And um, I wonder, do you, as sticking with that theme, what, what have, where have you found great light? And what has, what has been um, that you, things that in this last two years of a pandemic, spending more time alone, more time, uh, as you mentioned, uh, uh, creating art, toiling with art, what, what has been something that you have really enjoyed uh, or that you take joy in over the last year or two? In a way, I don't mind to be alone home and doing my art. It's, it's something to get up in the morning. I, I'm excited. I get up very early because I want to create something more. And most ideas come early morning to me. Also, I wrote my book. This was right the very beginning of the pandemic. I realized I will be cooped up in my home for months and months. And I had no idea how to start to write a book. I decided I will take like much of the living pictures and awards I got for my sculptures and I started to pull up all the memories and then I put them in an order and I was working 12 hours a day for two months and I finished the book. Wow. <laughs> was I'm curious, you know, they say sometimes when you when you write that it conjures up and awakens old memories or it helps, it, you know, you have to process to a certain extent memories again because you're you're writing it. It does. Was there was there anything in that process that 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 sticks out in your mind, a memory that you wrote that really perhaps had been forgotten in your recent memory? Was it was there something in the writing process that really uh, that really resonated with you as you put your story together? Yes, it, quite a lot. You are so right. Because as I was going, I went like step to step. I started from my childhood and years and days. And as I was going, all the memories in details came up. And I always was good to visualize what happened. And like, like a movie was in front of me, the days and days in the hiding. It just came back flooding in details. So it was kind of easy to write it down because suddenly I saw it. But I would assume also hard because those are also, as you see it, those there are, there's, um, I presumably deep, deep emotion Absolutely. and deep, um, the you know, fear, uh, the fear and the, yes, it's not easy, but I thought it's important. I am not a important. <laughs> somebody once said there's a silver lining. So I, so <laughs> even if it's a gray cloud temporary, the silver lining is a, is a beautiful, yeah. uh, a beautiful book. And, and can we, 
per can anyone purchase that book on Amazon? Do they email you? Do they email the March of the Living? Where can someone get this book? Okay, it is available on Amazon also, but okay. I have a website, GabrielaKarin.com, and the book is available there. And the advantage of it is because I have the book, I sign it, and I myself send it to the one who bought it. So well, I will be website. I'll be going on the website uh, later this afternoon, and I I am I uh, as we come to a close, I and in the spirit of shimmering leaves, and and so I wanted to ask. It's a two part question. The first part of the question is: fourteen years old, a young girl from Bratislava, hidden for nine months. Uh, thanks to Carol Blanner. But presumably, there are m several members of your family that were not so fortunate and that, in fact, were a falling leaf. And so with that in mind, I'm curious how many family members that you know of did not make it? I have a sculpture. 75 people. I have leaves there with their names. And today you have how, how many children, grandchildren, cousins, how many of your family are there today? If you had to guess a number. Okay, I was the only child. Right. So I... <laughs> I don't have siblings. Right. And, but and you my son. Who and he your son my is son ma got married. Mm -hmm. Jewish lady. And um, they had three children, two boys and a girl. And um, one of the boys is married. So I have a great grandchild, a little girl. She is one year and two months old. <laughs> so from so from one though, thank God you like I said, the the tree is growing again um, after so much uh, pain and loss. And where where does your son where is your family? Are they are they North California? Very nice. Those gatos, you know. Uh -huh. I do. I do. I'm a native to California. So, yes, I do. Well, uh, I want to thank you for taking the time. And I, I encourage people to, to buy your book uh, because I think that it's, as you said, it, it is up to the next generation to pick up the mantle. And to, as Monice Newman has said numerous times, uh, we become the witness to the witness. And we can only truly understand the Shoah if we learn it one plus one plus one. Numbers wash over us. But to take the time to learn some, an individual story, uh, we can only then begin to understand just the tip of, uh, of the enormity of, of loss uh, from the Shoah. So with that, uh, Gabriela, I hope that we can see each other in person in the near future, uh, whether it's uh, over coffee or tea or lunch. And of course, thank the International March of the Living uh, for their all of their incredible work, uh, including this web series with bringing Holocaust survivors to you uh, to share a little bit about themselves and their story. Thank you so much.